The following episode of the Maui Chamber of Commerce's Business Matters was originally broadcast on March 19th, 2024. It's time now for Business Matters, brought to you by Mokulele Airlines. Now here's your host, Pam Tupop. Good morning, Pam. How are you? Good morning, Gary. How are you? Very good. Very good. It's another beautiful Maui day. It's a beautiful Maui day, and we are glad to have you back. You have been missed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to be okay. back. <laughs> no, no, it feels good to get back in the routine. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. <laughs> well, we're grateful for all you do for our show, and you are so amazing. And so thank you so much for all the work you've been doing for us, and we're, we're just thrilled to have you back. I, but Cindy did a great job filling in while you were out. Well, that's good. Yeah. Well, welcome, folks, to Business Matters, brought to you by the Maui Chamber of Commerce. I'm your host, Pamela Timplop. And today uh, we are going to speak with Roseanne Prentice. She is the recently appointed, it's been several months now, but uh, as the CEO of the Building Industry Association of Hawaii. And we're going to talk with Howard Kihuni, president of Aino Lani Pacific. And, you know, um, while we wait for Roseanne, we're connecting with her this morning. I just want to give you a little update. We had such a great time this past Saturday. It was our annual uh, Biz Mix event. Now, Biz Mix is kind of a uh, mix and mingle networking event that we do annually as a fundraiser for the Maui Chamber of Commerce. And this year's theme was Under the Sea. Uh, phenomenal food by the, the great chefs at the Grand Wailea. Also, Chef Mark of 62 Market, um, which is in the Pono Building in Wailuku, right below us. We love tasting his food. He always is changing up the menu, and there are so many extraordinary things. But he made a spectacular uh, uh, lobster and uh, mango and edamame salad that was just uh, amazing and uh, kind of really surprised us all. And then we had uh, Lacaron from Fabiani's Bakery. And if you haven't tried the macarons, I just want to say that, um, you know, just really spectacular. A friend bought me one as a gift, and I had the uh, salted caramel. And I said to the gal that night, it's my favorite. I haven't really tried anything, but it's my favorite macaron uh, above any I've ever tasted. And she said, well, try some of these others tonight. And, and she's right. They're all really spectacular. The key lime pie is is pretty amazing too. It's it's on par with the salted caramel in my mind, um, and the you know the, the chefs over there outdid themselves. We, they recently reopened uh, the Humu restaurant, and um, and of course now the Kilohana Spa. So we really want to encourage everybody to um, go to the Grand Wailea and to to. Uh, Go back to Humo Restaurant, try it again. They've got a new menu. Go to the new Kilohana Spa, completely redone. And, of course, we couldn't do it all without um, our amazing sponsors. And our title sponsor was Alaska Airlines. And they just uh, did some phenomenal. I mean, you know, they're always a great partner, but they came and participated. And uh, one of the guests that they brought with them was, Trish, the lead singer of Kyrie, and she performed an acoustic performance without the band, just her with the guitar, which was amazing. So it was a phenomenal night, and we deeply appreciate all that came together to make the event successful. And so I'm just checking with Gary. Yeah, Pam, unfortunately, Gary, have... unfortunately I I'm still can't get there. Roseanne, would you like me to try to call Howard, see if he wants to get on a little early? Yeah, why don't we try Howard? Okay. See. That would be great. Okay, keep talking. Okay. <laughs> We're not sure. We hope all is well with Roseanne, and, and we'll check back in with her. Um, and, uh, we just talked to her the other day, so she might be busy or just held up in a meeting. We hope our traffic, so hopefully we'll hear from her soon. But uh, she's doing a, a great job as the new CEO of the Building Industry Association in Hawaii. Um, just met with some uh, national folks here in uh, Kapalua, 
they came to learn more about what's going on in Maui and huge supporters. You know, when we're ready to build housing, they're ready to be there. And not just housing, housing and infrastructure, it's the whole building industry association. But they're very supportive and they're very supportive of our local contractors and they're very supportive of being a strong support system for us. They just know that we need some time to get ready, but as we ramp up, you know, they are on standby and ready to help. And then, of course, uh, Howard King County and Honda Atlantic Pacific has been doing a lot of things. We know him as an amazing developer in this community who has focused on workforce housing, which has been a critical need for such a long time. And he's been getting uh, some phenomenal developments done. And we hope to talk to him soon and see if he's available. Um, but he was supposed to come on later in the show. So we're hoping that we'll connect with him a little bit later in the show, or hopefully move him up right now. But um, Nobody's home today, Pam. <laughs> Nobody's answering. <laughs> well, I know Howard wasn't expecting to. So. Right, right. But I left him a message. So, if you'd like to come on early, he can call in. So hopefully, Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> well, it's, 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 a big, it's the time, I guess, where we're going to instead, while we wait and hope, to, hope the guests come in, uh, it's going to be maybe a little surprising Tuesday morning, but share a little bit about what we've been doing. I know we've been talking about work with the SBA, and that's really important for many businesses right now. So, you know, let me kind of switch gears for a moment. Talk a little bit about that. You heard us talk about how... Um, there's, there was a technology change with their portal, which occurred, you know, during our disaster period. But they, you know, they're dealing with many, many disasters, and they did, had a new technology change. So, as any technology change happens, you see the learning curve, and and there were some things that occurred with some of uh, some of the paperwork going in a different location or not getting connected with some of the applications. But the best part is that as we were making the SBA aware of some of the issues that people in Maui were facing with the portal and and not everybody could keep taking off or, you know, they have a phenomenal center down key and, and a team is walking people through these applications and, and staying on top of them and continuing to connect. But not everybody could go down, so they were applying online. Or they would go down once or twice, but, you know, it was hard for them to keep taking off of work to go down to EA. The SBA is really working with us now on what we'll just call a concierge-type service. And for those who who are struggling with an application or not hearing back um, or have been declined but would like reconsideration, we at the Chamber are working with people one-on-one -on -one, um, and we are working with them to, if you haven't still applied, there's still time. Uh, but we're working with everybody who's in the in the portal now and trying to get them resolution, to get them to an answer. In some cases, we found that, you know, we also want to make sure that if you do have an application, make sure your, your correspondence from the SBA isn't going to junk mail. Continue to check. We encourage people to check their email daily because, in many cases, we found the SBA emailed them, um, and I'll go to calls in a minute, but the SBA emailed them, and sometimes they just missed one email. And then it kind of went down in the log, you know, as new emails came in, and they felt they didn't see it. And in some cases, they might have even missed the deadline. So um, we had to reconnect them with the SBA and move forward from that deadline, and that's easy to do. Um, we're they're working with us to make sure that if somebody missed an email, or, you know, at a deadline, that we get them back in the queue. And and then some people miss their acceptance, their loan acceptance. So we're working on that. In other instances, um, sometimes people are seeing that a call come in from a area code they don't know. And you know, we've all been so over flooded with these robocalls and solicitations and and people that we're not looking to hear from we're, and would prefer not to receive the calls. And if it's an area code you don't recognize, then you might not be answering the call. But I want to encourage you that if you're in for an SBA loan and you see a, a different area code, pick up the call. And the reason is they have experts in different areas across the 
the country who might be calling. Some of them might be at 212 from uh, D.C. But not all of the people doing the processing work are in D.C. So if you're waiting on a loan, pick up those unusual calls. If it's not the SBA, uh, tell them to stop the call um, and, you know, and uh, not call you again. And, of course, you can always go on the federal registry and, and list those numbers so that they don't call you. But I know that takes extra time. But just right now, uh, you can also call the Maui Chamber of Commerce, and you can call us at 244-0081. That's 244-0081. Um, if you don't know Amber of the Maui Chamber of Commerce, she is my right-hand dy- dynamic woman. We call her Chief Chamber Angel because she is connecting people with services, helping them move things forward, working with me to schedule my time so that we get those on uh, people who are struggling with an SBA loan on the list. And so we're doing very important work, and we're seeing progress. And this is a new service. This is the first time um, that this is really being done. And it's being done because the administrator, Isabel Guzman, the top woman at the SBA who heads the agency, appointed by President Biden, came and did listening sessions with us, came and heard from the people of Maui and said, this is not okay, and thank you for telling us this is going on. And she set up a system to bird dog this. So we are working with her top team. And and in addition to the names that we're giving them of people who've reported in to us, they're also going back and analyzing the system and seeing if there's other hiccups they can find so they can work with those companies to keep them moving forward. So it's been a really holistic approach. And, you know, we want to let people know this is the time because we're coming up against a a deadline in, uh, I believe it's May 10th, that should be the deadline when they stop taking SBA applications. However, we're working with them to say, you know, some people may not have gotten in yet. And there have been a lot of people, a lot of people, understandably so. Many businesses, <clears throat> some homeowners still have not tried to get a loan up. Well, let me let me share before I talk about some of the challenges we've had with the loan. Um, for those in the disaster who have not taken the home loan, you really should look at that because there are excellent home loans right now to help you rebuild. So... Um, or, you know, if you had partial damage, renovate. So you should really take a look at the home loans. Um, they also have equipment loans for businesses. And then, of course, they have the business loans. On the business loan side, many people said, well, I already have a loan with the SBA. I have an idle loan. I don't know now, given the devastation, how I'm even going to pay that loan, but a loan, take on another loan and more debt. But I really want to encourage you to look at it like an insurance policy. I know we all want grants. I I wish, I wish, I pray all the time, I wish we would see grant money come in in a substantial way where we would not have to look at these loan options because just grant money would be available to help all the businesses who are hurting. Um, it This is not like the national... COVID pandemic, where every legislator in every state, um, you know, saw that they had to do something urgent and put forward um, grants and, and, and money to help and extended unemployment. And, you know, they, they uh, specialized programs for different industries, um, like the shuttered venues and, and the restaurant industry and others. This is not that same level. And as you've seen, um, the same programs that are available to us have been available to all those other states who have been undergoing disasters as well, albeit there's diff- different types of disasters. So we're trying to work really hard. Um, we still are hoping and working towards grant money. But in the absence of that, people are now, especially as they're doing taxes, learning more and more about some of their business laws, um, you know, they're really looking at their cash flow, that we're, they're at a point where they've cut what they can cut, 
Um, they've kept as many employees as they can, if they can. Um, they're recognizing unemployment is running out for their employees on unemployment. And this loan might help you pivot. And so we want people to, before the May deadline, really consider it. And here's why. If you apply for the loan, first of all, if you're accepted, you have six months to even take the loan. Okay, that's a good period of time. You have six months to accept the loan. So that gives you another six months to think about it. Once you then accept the loan and receive the money from the loan, you have another 12 months, 0% interest, zero payments for 12 months. So imagine that now. We're talking 18 months. Six months where you could hold out if you can't still hold out and don't need to take the loan. Extend that time period to think about it. Okay, and then activate it. Or not. Or, or then decline it at that point. Um, so you've got six months to do that. Okay, then you've got another 12 months. No interest accrued. No payment. So that gives you 18 whole months to really look at it and evaluate your situation. And that's going to be a really critical time because, you know, we're, we're still looking at this. Um, I know many people this month, I know a lot of people tied to the visitor industry. We're hoping to see, as we've seen before, March is, you know, that spring break period that really brought us out of COVID. And really, we saw it was during spring break when we saw that spark of economic recovery. And then that wave kind of continued and we were we were coming out of COVID and we were starting to get back to some normalcy before the wildfires hit. So here we are and we've got many people who are just really struggling. And also, I just want to let you know that there are many great services here. There's so many great services in the business realm. The Taylor is always here to serve you, and we've been around for over 100 years. Uh, of course, you've got great counselors that can counsel for free with Wayne Wong at the Small Business Development Center. So he has been amazing, and um, and he has, has uh, uh, been counseling people for many years, helping them look at their business, looking at how to explore new areas. Um, and expand, looking at how to help them recover in times like this or pivot. He also has Fred, who also used to run that same office years ago, um, who is a financial wizard who can help you. And all of that is for free. Plus, they have a tremendous research team to help you look at your market data and help you get back to, um, you know, either the current markets and look at new ways of doing that or better understand your market and, and tweak your marketing or help you look at new markets. So, um, and if you're pivoting, help you look at new markets in the way that you're going to pivot. And all of that is free. And then if you're an entrepreneur and you, you or you, you weren't an entrepreneur, but now, you know, you, you've lost your job or your job hasn't come back and you're looking at unemployment running out and you have an idea, MEO has an excellent core four class that will help you get started. It'll help you take that business idea and examine that and help you look at how you can maybe look at starting a business and get moving forward. And they also do some micro business loan. So you can also work with MEO and see if you can get some micro-business loans to get started in a new arena. And then right now, you've seen there's amazing people through the SBA. We've got counselors through the SBA. We've got counselors available to you through the Maui Chamber of Commerce. And there's a whole cadre of people, um, both near and far, people locally who want to serve for free that are retired or just uh, spend some time counseling given the wildfires who are ready to make themselves available, um, along with people from the mainland who are through um, different civic organizations 
for people that we have contact with at the chamber who've reached out to us and said we're here to serve, or the SCORE program, um, which is um, the core, senior core of retired executives, both here in Hawaii and across the U.S., that are willing to make themselves available to those who have a need. So let us help you. Let us be that concierge service to connect you and your business with people who can help you during this time. We're all in this together, and we will move forward. We are known in Maui for being no koi, for having tremendous entrepreneurial spirit, for doing amazing things. Um, and so many are worried about their employees and want to help their employees get back to work. And we can make it happen. So we can and we will. And I just uh, encourage you, call us at 244-0081 or email us at office at MauiChamber.com. And that Chief Chamber Angel, Amber Kuto, uh, will be happy to help and and we will make connections for you and help you as we best can as well. Um, and Gary, I'm going to take a quick note. Uh, Roseanne is saying she's got a problem with her phone. Okay. Um, I, I was able to reach uh, Howard, and he's about just about ready. He was driving at the time. Okay, so. no problem. We'll get, we'll uh, ask Howie to come on, and and I'll um, I'll take a quick minute to text Roseanne and let her know we'll reschedule her. And in the meantime, if you could run our message from Mokalele Airlines. Mokalele Airlines operates the largest commuter airline hub in the country, right here in Kahului. Fly Mokalele from Kahului to Molokai, Manai, Hana, Waimea, Tona, and now Hilo. Mokalele also operates the only flights between Kapalua and Honolulu. There is never a middle seat on Mokalele, and every seat has a window and aisle. Visit MokaleleAirlines.com and take your next flight from the newly renovated Mokalele Terminal. Welcome back to Business Matters. So, Pam, I'm going to give, try to give Howard a call real quick here. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, How, uh, Howard Kihuni is the president of Inalana Pacific, and and technically, he he actually wasn't supposed to be on this morning till seven thirty-five. So we're asking him to do us the favor and see if he can join us a little early. And I'm glad that he can. And and is, but we want him to be safe. We want him to park and <laughs> and get to a point where he can join us on the radio show and be comfortable. Um, but he has been doing amazing things and has been focusing uh, on workforce housing since 2014. And as you know, for workforce housing, um, they have different what they call AMI levels, which is area median income levels that they look at. And, and it's kind of a complicated system, so I'm not going to even try to explain that. I'm going to let Howard try it. Okay, we got, we got Howard on the line. Explain that. Awesome. Uh, so we have Howard Kihuni Jr. joining us. Aloha, Howie. How are you? Good morning, Pam. How are you? I'm excellent. Thank you. I I know we had a bit of a hiccup, so thank you for joining with our first guest. So thank you for coming on a little bit earlier this morning. Ah, uh, no, not a problem. I wish I could earlier, but I was driving. Didn't want to get distracted. <laughs> no, and we didn't want. Yeah, we wanted you to be safe. <laughs> That's the most important <laughs> thing. Oh <laughs> uh, well, I'm so glad you could join us. And right now, it's still a little earlier, but I really appreciate it. But that's great. It gives us more time to talk about uh, our favorite topic, which is housing. Um, and, and I also want to mention that uh, Howard is on the board of directors for the Maui Chamber of Commerce as well. And the the chamber in this time, and, and actually for the past several years, in recognition of our housing crisis um, before the wildfires was certainly working on housing as a top priority. And it remains a top priority today because it is affecting our entire island. Um, so, Howie, I know one of the things that we've been asking you and, and a lot of people because of the great work you've been doing for, for years now. I mentioned you've been doing workforce housing since 2014. Um, is You've done so many developments that a lot of people have been looking to you to just try and understand current housing realities. And with a lot of the, you know, we saw during COVID prices starting to go up. We've seen all these wildfires on the mainland affecting lumber that 
I mean, trees that, that would normally be lumber. Can you talk to us about what's happening in in the cost of building a house right now? Um, <clears throat> yeah, you're correct there, Sam. I mean, the, the biggest challenge for us, and I think for most workforce housing and housing developers, is the cost of materials. Uh, labor labor s- seems to stay pretty steady um, throughout, but the cost of materials, for some reason, um, uh, somewhere you know, out of our control, that you probably know, has gone up almost three hundred percent. You know, ever since COVID, we've really taken a hit with cost of materials. Um, <clears throat> I still don't understand it. Uh, I'm not a rocket scientist, but um, I just can't seem to figure out, wrap my head around the numbers. Um, a lot of this material on the continental U.S. on the mainland is selling way under what we're paying for our materials here. And I know shipping's always been an issue, but, you know, the cost of construction is what it is. I mean, at, at this point in day and age, for us, I think for most developers, you know, the square footage cost for a home, you know, including all your labor, you know, is close to $300 a square foot. And, you know, on the mainland, they're still building for about 100 $120 a square foot, which is makes a lot of sense. But for us, you know, when <clears throat> everything that goes along to get in there, um, it, it's difficult. You know, you're trying to stay within a, 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 a price range that can satisfy the workforce side of, uh, of housing and development, and it's very difficult. So, you know, at, at this point, one of the only ways that you can move forward is uh, to, you know, to address and help develop more workforce housing is, you got to collaborate with with government, with you know your municipalities or your state, and try to bring in <clears throat> some money for infrastructure to offset that, so that you can go ahead and you can go ahead and appraise the homes at, at at a point that that you know that is that makes sense. So, um, you know, we're getting crunched from from all air from from all sides. Um, again, like not with only materials, but also, both you know, our, our home buyers with regards to uh, earnings and wages and stuff, you know, we're getting hit from both sides. And at the end of the day, um, you know, our main goal is to 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 try to make sure that we help meet the needs of, of our, our housing shortage when it comes to our local people. I know, and you have you have been working so hard at that, and and really creating. Workforce housing, but as you say, with the cost rising, it's getting really tough. You, you touched on infrastructure, and as, <clears throat> as you and I know, um, before the wildfires, we kept hearing, okay, well, where? show me the water. <laughs> Where's the water going to come from? Where's the sewer going to come from? Um, we continue to hear that, um, even though we've got some solutions for housing um, on the west side <laughs> to help people with this. Still, we come, you know, a lot of the comments we hear from the government is, where's the housing? I, excuse me, where's the water? Where's, where's the sewer going to come from? Can you talk a little bit about infrastructure, those costs, some of the challenges we've, we've had historically on water and sewer, and some of the also options we have as we look at some of the temporary housing solutions? Oh, sure. You know, um, <clears throat> with regards to you know, through infrastructure, it, it really, it really uh, comes down to working together, uh, both the municipalities and whether it be the state or the counties uh, with the developers to help bring infrastructure to a particular project or an area that helps <clears throat> reduce that cost. Um, that's the biggest cost right now is infrastructure. Again, I mentioned materials and stuff, but, you know, if you've got a utilities close by, nearby, or, or stubbed in, it really, really helps um, to deliver homes at a sales price that makes sense for, for our local buyers. Um, you know, again, it's just, <clears throat> I, I look at it, if, if there's a will, there's a way. Um, you know, common sense should over, always overcome anything else. Um, what we need to do is to continue to, to work together to, to be able to house, again, our local families. Um, regarding temporary homes, there's so many options out there. I think once 
you know, once they're stated, the county, you know, decides, makes up their mind what they what they would like to see and when they'd like to see it to be set up, I think we'll be in a better spot. I know they're continuing to work on trying to make that happen. Um, <clears throat> I'm not privy to all those, all those conversations, but, you know, I know there's, and I, I know you know it well, there's uh, so many options for temporary housing units. But, you know, from what I've been hearing, I know our line of residents and, you know, you know, um, they would like to stay on the west side and trying to yeah. set something up has been very difficult. So, you know, I know the challenges are there, especially with even for a temporary site would be water, would be sewer. You know, how do you how do you handle all of that? And that's important, you know, especially when it comes to wastewater. You know, there are there are systems that can handle um Waste um, that um, uh, that can be above ground, but again, it's just a matter of again. It's a if you got you know, if there's a will, there's a way. You just need to figure it out and work together. Yeah, and you've been part of that. That we we've been excited of late to see uh, FEMA come together. We had a listening session. Uh, Howie was included in that with basically six. Well, five developers and one communication specialist come together to work with FEMA and show them options and models to say, we have local options and models, so, you know, that we don't have to always look at bringing something in from, from the outside. We have local companies who have solutions, and you can look to them. They were all varied solutions because we wanted to show them a range of things that were available, uh, but they were blown away, and as a result, they created a special registry day where local uh, developers and contractors and service folks would register to do business with the FEMA, with FEMA and be ready. And this week there's RFPs coming out. So we're really excited that local companies will have a chance to register. I, I, with us. And you're right there. I mean, we have a, we have a lot of other interrupters. We have a lot of talent here on the island yeah. in the state. So, you know, I think um, uh, that's a great, a great move on uh, on their part, um, and I think it's you know it, it does help our economy here for sure. And again, um, you know, let's put our own people to work and try to solve and and get to a point where we can he can mobilize and, and get these temporary shelters or homes up as quick as possible. Absolutely. So then that takes us to well, two couple things. We're, you know, one I know is. Clearing the land and, and making sure that we we make sure the land is safe before we get moving forward. Um, you know, and the the other issue is permitting. How can we streamline? And that, that's something you know we've been talking about, and and we continue to see areas during disasters where there's where there's opportunities through proclamations and other things to help streamline things, not to avoid and and be unsafe in the building. But to, to move things forward quickly, uh, can you share with me some of your thoughts on that, or ways we can we can help get through that? And, and I know it's going to come back down to partnerships too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know the process the process has always been uh, has been uh, cumbersome, uh, uh, you know, uh, to say the least, when it comes to processing permits and stuff. And it's nothing against you know uh, any individual or anything. It's just the process that we have here in Maui. And, uh, other counties have this, you know, some of the same issues that we do, but time is money. <clears throat> and with, you know, in regards to the fire and fires and trying to get that to move forward, I think, um, you know, it, it, I believe that they're setting up an expedited process for those that that would like to uh, rebuild at some point, um, which I'm happy to hear from what I, what I understand. Um, you know, I think, um, Zoning and you know codes and all that stuff will play a part in I think the rebuilding of the residential areas in Mahina and then eventually the commercial side. Um, I don't know what that looks like, but um, you know I think um, you know they will get it sorted out with I think input from the community and and try to expedite and move things you know hopefully move things as quick as possible. Um, but you know they're there the the time is of the essence um i'm not sure exactly when the cleanup is supposed to be completed or when uh, areas that they're going to open up but 
I'm still <clears throat> I'm still assuming that there's a lot of infrastructure work that has to go in regards to those areas that were wiped out. Um, you know, regards to probably electricity, possible water, sewer, all those have, have got to come in play. I mean, some of the neighborhoods were uh, were the you know the how can I say uh, the public streets and and things are probably built back in the 30s and the 20s or even before. So. Yeah. You know, how does the code affect that now? You know, how do you reestablish that neighborhood that was developed when codes were not as, how can I say, stringent or, or um, you know, as they are now? Um, how do you address okay. that? How do you, how do you maneuver through and try to reestablish that neighborhood uh, without losing <clears throat> You know, you probably have to, you're going to, you're going to lose, I would say, not company, but you're going to have to expand the roads, create curves and gutters and all this stuff where at that point in time, back then, it was not required, right? So, yeah, I, I it's not an easy job. I'm glad I'm not the one <laughs> on that side, <laughs> but, you know, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's a, it's a challenge um, trying to, um, maneuver and negotiate, try to get through this and, and all the departments working, you know, public works and everybody planning, trying to figure out how they can reestablish <clears throat> in the residential areas first, for sure, I'm pretty sure. Um, and even in town at some point, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you get through this? And and I think, uh, again, there's going to have to be a lot of collaboration between, you know, the different departments, administration, the community, and you know that important, you know, and and again, that's 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 a task in itself. So yeah, yeah. And and I was recently talking to uh, a gentleman who's been working on the clearing out in uh, Lahaina and uh, with Army Corps of Engineers, and he said, you know, also um, in some cases they're still waiting for people to say, you know, as they're cleaning, they're waiting for landowners to say. Yes, you can clean my area or not. You know, I want to handle it on myself. And we've been encouraging people to let them do it because it, it can be far more expensive. They may find out later if they agree, say they'll do it themselves. But in the meantime, as they're sort of going down, say, a track, they've got these hiccups where if they don't have those agreement in place, then they kind of have to work around and, and it can hold up progress a little bit. So we hope to help them uh, with some of the folks that we can help reach out to to um, see if we can't help that move forward as well. Yeah. You know, you... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was say, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's just, you know, trying to determine as a homeowner that, you know, uh, that was affected by the fire, what direction do I go? You know, that that's, you know, something that I'm, I'm pretty sure is, uh, uh, is going on, for sure. You know, because we have some friends uh, that are in the same situation, some of them have yeah. opted to whip through FEMA, and then, you know, some have decided that they think they want to do it at own. Um, I don't know how cost-effective it is, but, you know, um, since you've got the crew on on site, <clears throat> I would assume that you would probably work through FEMA to get it done sooner than later. But, you know, again, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not privy to all of that information. Yeah. Yeah, nor I. But <laughs> it was it, it was it was interesting kind of a discussion, and and in some cases with some of the businesses, they asked if we could help reach out or help connect, and we certainly can. So we're going to try and do that on uh, the business side. You've been doing a lot of work looking at new models for housing, and um, and and working with people who. At, you know, we I guess what we're calling them now is modular homes, and and a lot of people that that's such a broad term because I think a lot of people first think of like tiny homes or or they think of a modular homes as like container homes. Can you talk a little bit about what you've been seeing in manufacturing and what these homes can look like? I've been so impressed to see some of the models. Um, and to learn really that they could be like an everyday home. Can you talk about some of the things that you're finding um, in terms of where they're getting manufactured and what the design can look like? Um, yeah, sure. Um, you know, again, there's a wide range of, uh, well, if you want to tag them as modular homes or um, uh, 
uh, manufacturers throughout, you know, on, in, on the mainland um, that have some beautiful, beautiful products. Um, and um, again, probably in a price range that really is very effective as far as cost effective. Um, you know, they have, you know, homes that, um, that run from 800 square feet all up to almost 2,700 square feet. And, you know, you put them on a barge and you get them here. But, um, again, I understand <clears throat> how things work. And, you know, one of the products that I've been quite impressed with is I've been looking at this for some time. A friend of mine has a, built a home up in Olukupalakua using this system. is SIP, Structural Insulated um, <clears throat> um, uh, Panels. And um, so there's a company down in Hawaii, it's an offshoot from a company called Premier, uh, Premier SIP. Um, Hawaii SIP is what they're called. And it's an effective way to, to really build homes, uh, probably in a more cost-effective way, uh, specifically. Um, um, but the homes would probably have to look more modern. In other words, you probably won't have thick roofs and things like that, but um, more gable and stuff. But very cost-effective, goes up pretty quick, saves you a lot of time, but you still use skilled labor. That's one of the products that I'm kind of looking at for another project that we're, we're working on right now. Um, um, but again, getting back to your question, you know, Mark, there are so many companies. There's Boxel, there's River, the other side. There are so many companies out there that have these products that could be effective here um, uh, well, you know, to help move and get um, <clears throat> our wildfire victims into housing. But then again, at the end of the day, on the, you can use it under the proclamation, but at the end of the day, those that have to be removed. So is there a product out there that that we as a county and state would accept that could go from a temporary to a permanent product? I don't know if you know what I mean, but something that has a double, we have more than one use out of it. Um, something that we could, if we bring it in or we develop it here, that could go under the proclamation for temporary housing. <clears throat> And at the end of the day, say two, three, four years down the road, we can we can pick it up and move that and use that as what I call the humanitarian village for homelessness, or that unit can become a pem permanent home on that property. You know, uh, as a, you know, when it started as a temporary home. So, and I, I'm not sure what you know what the discussions are, um, and I, I don't want to speculate, but. Um, and hopefully those are part of those discussions, trying to see how they can be more effective, cost, and, you know, cost effective. Um, it's nice to purchase something that you can use at least twice, right? So um, that's kind of what we were doing with our project, uh, with our product that we distributed it's called Structurally Build, Aptum Build. Um, but, you know, it, it has more than one use. So, um, but anyway. Well, yeah, and I'm going to talk about that because, one of the things that we we were talking about with with the Atom Build product that you have, and, and as you mentioned, there are others because they're modular. One, they they go up quickly, <laughs> so, which is amazing. I mean, the homes can be built in in you know in the in in a very short period of time. Um, but also, people could potentially be put in temporary homes that gets them back to a sense of normalcy, it would allow them to have their pets. And then when their lot is available, they, it can be taken down and put back up and be just as safe, you know, and, and still last as long um, and be their permanent home. If they, if at that point, they, that's what they'd like to continue to live in. Can you talk a little bit about, about how long these homes last and, and how they can be moved so that they have that second use either for long-term for the family to live in them temporarily or for, you, you mentioned, the human, uh, humanitarian village. Um, yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I, I know most of the products that are out there <clears throat> on the market or that are available um, close to a, you know, 20-year lifespan, um, which, is, which, is, which is what we would need um, to have at least a dual use out of it here on Maui or in Hawaii. Um, you know they're all they're all ready that hurricane you know kept for hurricane um, uh, 
marginally rated, um, and um, most of them, are, or from all of them, most of them are very well built and well structurally designed. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say, you know, which product I like best, but there are quite a few good products out there, and um, you know, it's just a matter, like I said, it's just if you have the if you have the will, the the will the way. We just got to figure that out. And whether whatever product we bring in or whatever product we deliver here would be able to adapt, hopefully adapt to, you know, our environment, our, our weather, and all that good stuff. And, and that's the key. Um, you know, land is an issue, too. I'm trying to get off track with what your question was, Sam, but land is an issue. You've got to have the area to, to, to put these units up. Um, yeah. And that seems to be the question of, you know, of the years, where are we going to put these? I know there's been discussions, and again, I'm not privy to those to those discussions, and I'm not going to anticipate anything. But I think that would be the key that you know, where where would we put these um, on the west side? And is there water? And is there sewer? And all that good stuff. But um, um, anyway, sorry I got off track with your question. Apologize. Not not at all, and that that's a really important point. And and I'll just share a thought I have. Um, I know we've got a lot of, a lot of you know, large-scale landowners, and I know maybe some of them are not interested in selling. And um, one of my questions is, and again, I too am not privy to those discussions, but my hope is that, that maybe if they wouldn't sell, because we're talking about temporary homes, and, and you know, we don't know what the range for temporary means. You know, we, in best-case scenario, we'd like it to be three to five years. We certainly hope that's true. But we've also heard stories where, you know, in paradise, some things took 10 years. So the good news is some of these models that you're talking about, certainly, you know, as you said, 20 plus years, but you'd actually have two years of that about at least. Um, but I'm hoping that maybe some of the large landowners, if not willing to sell, might be willing to lease. Um, and, and we can look at some of that as an option because there's there's a lot of land, hillside, and, and um, I think that we're very blessed and grateful to have that available. And, and again, though, we get turns around the infrastructure, <laughs> other tie-ins, but something really important to look at. Um, how are you been dealing with workforce housing since 2014, uh, doing many different developments? Uh, you, you're wrapping up a, a development up at uh, Hawaii Miley. Can you talk a little bit about Workforce housing, I know that's something, you know, again, for so many of our local residents, it's so critical. A little bit about maybe AMI levels that you've been working in and, and maybe a description of what that means in terms of uh, AMI and um, and how many units you've been doing of late. Um, well, sure, sure. Um, so, you know, we've been, again, like you said, we've been working on this since 2014. Um, you know, our, our passion is to, to help build for our local people. Um, this, at one time in my life, I was a product of workforce housing. I bought my first house as uh, under a workforce housing uh, project that the county had developed back in the day in Tihe. And I was very fortunate. Um, you know, it helped me to, to move my family forward. And um, it, 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 um, also brought my family together, which was great because at that time, you know, interest rates were running with 17, 17 percent. <laughs> and, and yeah. uh, you know, it, it wasn't like it was or is now to some degree. But, um, but you know, we our goal is to work with the community, work with our local governments to try and see how we can can help uh, develop more workforce housing here in Maui. Um, and um Continue trying to find ways, be innovative, and how we build and everything else. But you know, our goal is to develop a quality home that that you know that, that does last for thirty years. It will, from with in, with all the products and materials that we use, you know, because here in Hawaii, we all know that most workforce or most homes become generational. Uh, it might be three generations at some point. So you know, we're very conscious of that and what we're building and and and, and our model. Um, but, you know, we, um, we continue to work. We did our projects on the west side, uh, one in Kaunapali, one up in Mapini Kapalua. We have a project up in Huli Miley. 
We have our project in Kihei. Um, we working on a couple projects now that they combine probably produce about 600 more more homes. And then we've got a rental project we're working on here in Kahului that potentially could um, be a complete rental project for about 12 to 1400 units. So we've got some things going on and we're, we're working diligently to try and bring them to fruition. So, um, but again, the goal, again, I keep saying this, if, if there's a will, there's a way. You just got to want to get it done. And um, I'm not saying that we're the only ones that do it, but I know everyone wants to participate. Everybody wants to help. All the developers are trying to find ways to 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 create more housing in general. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not an advocate for it, but sometimes you got to go vertical to to accommodate unit numbers, right? So yeah, um, I'm we're more of a single family home builder developer, um, and that's that's our model. That's what we like <clears throat> to develop. But it doesn't say that, you know, going vertical is not the way to go. Uh, I think to meet some of the demands that we got in front of us in, in this county, you may have to go vertical, you know, two or three stories to try to accommodate and, and to help, you know, to soften that demand. But, you know, that's something that our lawmakers have to decide and the county has to decide. Um, but, um, you know, again, it's there. there's opportunity and I think there'll be more opportunity for our local families going forward. Um, but <clears throat> again, you, we have to all work together, you know, as far as government and developers to, to move things in a, how can I say, a speedy, uh, speedy um, um, or speedy process to kind of get things out sooner than later. But real quick, uh, having, you know, uh, if you don't mind, I, I apologize for cutting you off. Uh, can you let people know how they can reach out to you or, or look up your projects and learn more? Um, our projects are all on, <clears throat> most of our projects are online. Uh, we don't have a website um, for whatever reason we don't, but, uh, you know, Hokuola Maui, um, Kilohana Makai, Kayalo, I believe the website is still up, but, you know, um, we you can reach out to us to hokulamali dot com and uh, we'll, we'll be happy to to assist or answer any questions anyone has. So no problem. Oh, uh, thank you so much. It's been great having you on the show. I appreciate all of your information for everybody. We hope you'll tune in next Tuesday. And I just want to wish everybody blessings and aloha for a beautiful Maui week.